Um, I'm going to talk to you for about 10, 15 minutes about sustainability in payments, which is a topic you may or may not have already considered. Um, and the, the, the talk is in two halves. First of all, we're going to look at the impact of payments. And secondly, we're going to look at what payments can actually do for the planet in a positive sense as well. So my background, I've worked in payments technology for the last 20 years. Um, I've worked in the past for ACI worldwide, for the now defunct bank Credit Suisse. Um, in 2010, I co-founded a company called Infraxis. We built a payments processing um, technical solution um, that was acquired by an Italian payment software vendor in 2020, which gave me a moment to stop and think about what I want to do with my career going forward. And, you know, spending 20 years looking at trillions of transactions and looking at the sort of mound of data that you can assemble as a payments processing company. I thought, well, look, this could be very interesting in terms of uh, using as a proxy for climate data, for estimating impact, for estimating CO2 emissions. So I founded a company called EarthChain. We're a small startup based in the UK, three co-founders, and um, absolutely passionate about what we can do with payments to achieve better sustainability. So let's get into it. Now, the premise for this talk is the fact that we have a climate emergency underway. And like any emergency, you have to act urgently. You have to act now. And the analogy that I would like to use, like to keep in the back of your heads um, during the talk, is the idea of what happens when you're on an airplane, God forbid, um, that the cabin depressurizes and you have to put on your oxygen mask. The protocol for doing that is, first of all, you put on your own oxygen mask and you do it quickly. You do it in the first five to 10 seconds of the emergency. And then you put on the oxygen mask of the person sitting next to you, ideally a child. If you want to do it with an adult, that's up to you. Um, and so this analogy is what I'd like to use to, to describe how payments companies can, first of all, um, look after their own emissions and secondly, help others to do that. So let's get into that. The reason that we need to act now is the greenhouse gas emissions that commerce effectively, when you get down to it, is emitting into the atmosphere. What you can see here on the chart, this is the last 30 years of greenhouse gas emissions entering the atmosphere. Um, I chose the last 30 years on purpose because 30 years ago, the um, IPCCC came into um, effect and the Kyoto and the Paris Agreements are all products of that. The COP meetings that you hear about every year are a product of that as well. So this is top-down policy level change attempting to um, address our CO2 emissions. And as you can see from the chart, it has risen and risen and risen over the last 30 years. Apart from there are two very significant dips in there. You see the first one there aligns with roughly 2008. And the second one aligns roughly with 2020. And these are changes in our economic behavior, driven first of all in 2008 by the banking crisis and in 2020 by the COVID pandemic. And for me, that's a clear indication that consumer behavior, economic behavior can put a dent, and it's the only thing that can put a dent in our greenhouse gas emissions. So I think it's effective. Um, and to do this, we need to create immediate action. We need to get moving quicker than we are now. The second reason to act now is regulation. So as part of the Paris Agreement, um, governments and, for example, the EU are now releasing policies. They're coming into the effect which uh, forces companies of a certain size to disclose their emissions. So one example is the European um, Green Deal and the CSRD. This now makes climate emissions reporting and ESG reporting mandatory for more businesses than ever before. Um, any businesses having two or more of the... Uh, Facts in the top box there, 40 million in turnover or 20 million on the balance sheet or over 250 employees have to, from 2024, report their emissions. Um, the scope of this is not just related to carbon emissions. It's also related to the entire suite of ESG concerns. Um, social practices, governance practices, um, how you relate to employees and suppliers and basically how you be nice to humans, if you want to put it in a really basic term. Um, another piece of regulation that came into effect or is about to come into effect is in France. They have banned the automatic printing of receipts at a terminal, which is something that relates directly to payments. And now the consumer gets to choose whether they print out several centimeters of plastic paper. Um, and I think that's something we'll, we'll talk about more on the panel as well. So bit by bit, more and more regulation is coming, which is forcing companies to take action. And thirdly, consumer pressure is growing. There are more and more 
um, surveys coming out which demonstrate that consumers are increasingly interested in sustainability as a topic, particularly when it relates to purchasing and when it relates to the brands that they have relationships with. Um, one statistic that really stood out for me was one done by um, Nielsen IQ recently. They did a consumer survey on attitudes to sustainability. 47% of those who they surveyed who were consumers said that they actually now fear the impact of climate change. So it's no longer so abstract. It's getting closer and closer. We're experiencing more extreme weather. We're experiencing flooding, and we're seeing these risks happening for themselves. Uh, I'm seeing it too. I was stranded on a motorway in the UK a couple of weeks ago because of such ridiculously heavy snowfalls in a country that was unprepared for that shock because it's not typical where I live. But it happened. I slept with my 74-year-old mother in the car on the top of a hill, which was unpleasant. So now let's look at payments themselves. We're not talking now about the things we buy. We're talking about simply the payment itself, that for which we, as payments processors, uh, payments technology companies, are responsible. And the information here comes from a report that was uh, created a number of years ago now by the Nederlandse Bank, which was kindly st shared with me by um, Stephen King of Visa. And they put together a life cycle cost analysis of a payment transaction. Worked out that one payment transaction is about 3.78 grams of CO2. Um, I'm not one for getting down into the decimal points when it comes to carbon footprinting. I think it's really important to know, uh, let's say with some scientific rigor, how close or what the impact is of anything that you carbon footprint, but whether it's 0.78 or 0.8 makes little difference in the end. But it's interesting to see how that's composed. So 75% of that comes from the terminal, um, the materials of the terminal, the energy consumed by the terminal. 11% comes from the data center, and 15% comes from the card itself. So this is looking at the payment itself. It's not looking at operations, it's not looking at your lighting in your building, it's not looking at your coffee, it's not looking at your employee commutes, it's not looking at your company travel. It's simply the carbon that's intrinsic in the payment itself. So 3.78 grams, that's nothing, is it? You know, imagine holding that in your hand, you could barely notice it. However, when you multiply it by the number of transactions that are taking place and realize the scale at which we're doing this, in the Eurozone in 2021, there were 15, 50 billion electronic retail transactions. Each of those with their 3.78 grams actually amounts to 189,000 tons of CO2 emitted just through the payment, just through the facilitator of the transfer of funds. That's pretty huge. If we were paying with cash, incidentally, it would be significantly higher. So electronic payments are already better than cash in terms of the CO2 emissions. So one or two things to consider. Um, I'm not prescribing the solution here. I'm just giving you some food for thought about what we can do specifically about the footprint of a payment itself. One of the things, obviously, the energy that the terminal uses is quite important. If we can communicate with our merchants and we can consider that merchants could be using renewable energy, could be switching to renewable tariffs, then they could lower the impact of the energy consumption of the terminal. We can look into the terminal configuration. Is it switching off when the shop's closed, or is it staying open all night just because just after midnight there's going to be a reconciliation process, or just after midnight there's going to be a software update? Can we not, not do that and uh, perhaps wake on LAN or find another technical solution for uh, getting the terminal online during the night? Then paperless receipts. Do we need to be printing thermal paper? Thermal paper is actually made of plastic, and it's, it's terrible. Um, I was talking to Chris, who we're going to meet on the panel in a few minutes. Um, I was in France, and I was feeding my children at a, uh, a convenient restaurant en route. And this, this terminal printed out like a meter of paper. It was completely unnecessary, and it was absolutely pointless. Um, I nearly took a photograph of it to send to him, because he's interested in the topic. Um, yeah, it's not so good. And then finally, you know, when it comes to the, the, the terminal hardware itself, can we make the machinery more modular? Can we make it more circular? Can we return the machinery to the uh, manufacturer? Can it be reused in some way? Can it be repurposed for something else? I don't know. These are all things to think about. And then the data centers themselves. Can we make them more efficient? Can we run our processes in the cloud? Can we make them elastic so that they grow as demand grows for payments and then shrink again uh, when the demand recedes? Can we do that? 
Um, can we use green coding principles when we develop software that processes payments as well to minimize the impact? Just as an aside, the platform that we have at Earthchain, we built that originally without taking that into account. We ran it in the cloud. We winced at the costs. And we applied green coding principles that not only reduced the CO2 impact of the inefficient processing, they also massively reduced our costs as well. That's exciting. So lots of things to do there. And then on the card side, there's some really interesting developments taking place as well. So um, G&D, uh, they have a project that really inspired me. They're working together with Parley for the Oceans to manufacture cards instead of out of virgin PVC. They're manufacturing them out of plastic that's recovered from the oceans. There are even some companies out there who are manufacturing cards now from wood, which is, is quite aesthetically beautiful, um, but it also lowers the CO2 footprint of the card itself. Now we're going to move on to part two. So moving away from the impact of the payments themselves, moving towards what payments could do to help others decarbonize and to drive finance for climate projects. So this is the idea then, after the 10 seconds of looking after ourselves, looking after the people who occupy the planet with us as well. One of the things that I like about payments is the ability to address an absolutely huge number of people. And it works a little bit like a pyramid, whereby at the top you may have a bank or an acquirer or a payment processor. Beneath that, you have the merchants that they work with, and beneath that, you have the consumer. And the higher up in that pyramid that you go, the higher up in that chain you go, uh, the easier it is to multiply and amplify your impact. So if we can intervene somehow at the payment service provider, at the bank, or at the acquirer, um, we have a chance to reach more people. So what are the ways that we can help merchants and their consumers? Well, we have surfaces that we can make available to both the consumer through the terminals and the e-commerce checkouts that we use. We have services that we can make available to merchants through the uh, portals that they use to manage their payments as well. And so we can offer a bunch of different services as payments processes that can help merchants. One of them could be, for example, carbon accounting. Now, interestingly, SMEs in the UK make up 99% of all different businesses, all the types of businesses out there. And they're responsible for 50% of the carbon emissions in the UK as well. But only 3% of them are actually forming a strategy to measure and reduce their carbon emissions. And I think a lot of that is down to the complexity and the number of moving parts that they have. So could we not make it easy for a merchant to integrate a carbon accounting system into their portal that they use to handle their payments? And it can be semi-automated. We can gather data from their uh, transaction volumes, and we can use that to help to estimate some of the emissions as well. Um, and it becomes a value-added service for a payment technology provider as well to give this service to their merchants. Secondly, we see more and more banks now starting to provide carbon footprint, carbon scoring in the banking app. Uh, MasterCard and Visa are both partnering with companies who do things like that. Um, but what some of these tools don't quite achieve is to understand the nuances between different retailers, which retailers, which merchants are taking action, and which aren't. And I think that's an important thing for consumer choice, that you can look at some data and understand where is the better place to spend your euro. Um, so CO2 estimation on the merchant side can be more accurate. You know a lot more about the merchant's supply chain. They can volunteer information about the products, and that can be used to create a better estimate of the CO2 than can be estimated on the banking side with the data available there. And the point of this is it helps to change consumer behavior. It helps to educate consumers. And it also motivates retailers to start to change as well. Thirdly, educating customers as well. You know, consumers are increasingly interested in this as a topic. And it would be very, very useful for consumers to be given information about that which they're, they're buying or the action that's been taken by the merchant, the strategy that's been taken to reduce the CO2. Um, and I think that. It's possible as well for payment service providers, for payments platforms, to surface some of that information. And it's data-driven. It's science-driven, which can be then presented to the consumer in consumer-friendly ways and educate them about exactly who they're buying from and, and how they're dealing with the, uh, the sustainability strategy. Here's an example of that. So there's a Norwegian supermarket called Oda. And during the pandemic, they started to print what they called the climate receipt. And they started to put a sort of traffic light on the bottom of their receipts that would allow a consumer to simply know if what they've bought is high CO2, medium CO2, or low CO2. And it actually changed behavior. 
people started to move away from buying meat and they moved towards more vegetable products, lower carbon products, and it had an impact. Um, and Oda are working now to continue that, to create life cycle analyses of more and more of their products so that this can become more and more accurate over time. Another sort of option available as well is the ability to drive climate finance through programs that merchants can deliver to consumers, so climate action programs. And I'll give you some examples of those in a minute. In a study that we did with a PSP um, in the EU, we found that just a 0.75% enrollment of merchants in a climate program, giving 1% to planet-saving projects, could result in an annual CO2 reduction of 350 to 500,000 tons of CO2 a year. That's really impactful. Comes very, very quickly. So the final thing. The IPCC, this is you know, kind of almost breaking news, the IPCC released their synthesis report last week on climate change. And one of the most important things that they said was improving availability and access to finance for decarbonization projects. This kind of thing, this kind of merchant climate program is something that can really help with that. It creates a new source of funding, a non-traditional source of funding, which can be directed into projects that are looking for constant funding to keep the projects going and to expand them. So some examples of climate programs for merchants. The first one, one of the pioneers, was Stripe with the Stripe Climate. They enable merchants to dedicate a percentage that they select themselves towards carbon removal projects. Um, what they do is they finance R&D into projects that are pulling CO2 out of the atmosphere, for example, turning it into rocks or absorbing it into um, minerals, which can be then used on fields and uh, improve soil conditions. Um, they've seen something like an 8% sign-up rate of new merchants. So the figures I quoted before were a, a 0.75%. Stripe's managing 8 So the, the merchants are clearly engaging with this. Second one is Shopify with ShopPay. So they now provide a carbon removal bundle anytime anybody pays with ShopPay. And this is paid for by Shopify themselves. And they fund projects that are doing carbon removals um, without the merchant having to make any kind of commitment and without the consumer having to make a decision at the point of sale as well. That's a really interesting model. And then finally, an example of a merchant. This is Galaxus Digitech in Switzerland. They went and implemented their own solution at the checkout. And please don't judge me that my basket's just full of Lego. Um, just is. But they offered a checkbox during checkout where the consumer can decide whether they want to purchase a carbon compensation or not. And they implemented it themselves. So this is a way to engage with the, the consumer on this as well. So three models, one where the merchant pays, one where the payments process pays, and one where the consumer pays. All great examples. So that was an introduction to the main event, which is the panel discussion. So um, Helen, would you like to come up and uh, kick off the moderation for that? Thank you, Dan. That was really interesting. Thank you. Thank you.